Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our podcast. This is I Compete, Building Your Empire with John Hewitt, live from the castle. Hi, I'm Roberta Barrett. I'm John Hewitt's producer. You might be asking, who is John Hewitt? Well, he is the Hewitt in Jackson Hewitt Tax Services. If you want to find out more about John Hewitt and what he's currently doing, go to loyaltybrands.com. That's loyaltybrands.com. Or find John T. Hewitt on LinkedIn or Facebook. John Hewitt's made over a thousand millionaires and you could be the next one. Here is your host, John Hewitt. My pleasure today to welcome Steve Rafsky, one of our team. He's CEO of Ledger's brand, one of our greatest brands. And uh, for my money, he's one of the premier negotiators in in the world. And and uh, I don't give praise lightly. So Steve, welcome and, and uh, tell us a little bit about your past. Well, thank you, John. I'm glad to be on the podcast with you. And uh, actually, I only worked for two companies prior to this. I worked for a a public company in retailing. I was an executive growing up as an executive for 20 years. I did a lot of mergers, acquisitions, a lot of negotiation. That's where I learned what we're about to talk about today. Then I went on to franchising. I was with Patch Business Services, and through that, we built the largest accounting franchise in the United States and Canada. So, uh, so a little bit about me. Awesome, great, great career, and uh, great success, and a, a great partner. And let's talk about how many, how many key, uh, how many key things are there in um, negotiating? There's five or six very key things. Okay, give us, give us all, give us all them. Uh, we have we only have a half hour, so give them to us quickly. Well, let me give you some of the highlights first. So first of all, you've got to believe in what you're negotiating because your first goal and the first point I like to make is you've got to make the other side understand the extraordinary opportunity it is to do business with you. So when you're negotiating, that's the first thing is to establish that credibility. Uh, second, it's got to be win-win. We all know that, but we actually have to do that. It's got to be good for them. It's got to be good for us. One of the most important things is to listen more than you speak. Listening allows us to understand where the opportunities are to get to the best deal for both sides. But while you're listening, another key point is that we don't want the transaction. You can't want that transaction more than the other side. So the the other side if you do it right, we'll want the transaction more than you. To that point, walking out, if necessary, is a good practice. You've got to be willing to be walk, to, to walk out of the transaction if it doesn't feel right. And back to listening, one of the main reasons you need to listen is because the other side is either putting up hurdles or put-offs to getting to where you want to go. And by listening, you will determine where the real hurdles are. When you know the hurdles, you can win. And I think the last thing in the short list is it's not always about the size of the deal. It's about where the potential of the size of the deal today. It's about where the potential will take you tomorrow. Awesome. Let me uh, start with sit first open-minded and you sort of added credibility to that. I'm going to separate them, but uh, open-minded that I think I have a different view than, than virtually any, almost everyone. And that is that um, when I go into a deal, I try not to have a deal in mind. So I think that's what you mean by open-minded that you don't know the right deal when you walk into the negotiations. And sometimes you're negotiating one thing and uh, other, uh, something else is, is more, is more viable or sometimes as you said you're negotiating one thing and there's a a much bigger long time future so um does that make sense for for uh, uh, what you're saying at open-minded any anything else you'd like to to add to open-minded well i couldn't agree with that more and i will add one thing i've done some negotiations for you now john and The one thing you do that's great is we can sit down and we can understand what your parameters are, but you give that authority over to the person who's doing that negotiation. And that's exactly why what you just said will work. When the person doing the negotiation has the ability to figure out 
how to get to where it needs to go and not come in with the, the, everything beside it, you're going to be more successful. You know, I think that uh, it must be hard. You're you're a talker, so it must be hard for you to listen most. I'm I'm an introvert, and it's so much easier for me to listen and just ask questions. And I think you said it in between in in your opening, but it it seems to me that um, to be clear, whoever in a negotiation, typically whoever talks most loses, whoever talks least wins. Uh, true or false? Absolutely, 100% true. So, and that, that's why I listed that as one of my key points. I have been trained to listen when I'm doing deals. That's when you win. So, and you, you talk about credibility. Um, credibility comes down to, uh, it's, it's not proven during the negotiation. What do you need to do up front to establish credibility? In today's world of credibility, it means a lot of things. You get your initial credibility because people check you out. But you want to drive them to the places that give you the most credibility. If we're doing something for loyalty, of course, John Hewitt and your background is part of the credibility building process you do. How many people have accomplished what we've accomplished or what you've accomplished in the past like we have? That's a credibility statement. We also want to look at where we are today. And if you have a vision, believe it or not, people can, if you are bought into your vision and that vision is clear, that is the credibility factor that helps you with building something for tomorrow. And, and during the negotiation, I think one of the ways that, that I've established credibility in the past is that I'm, I try to be sensitive and understand the other person and ask questions. And they, they need, what, what's the phrase, Steve, that um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care? And I think that, right. that that establishes credibility. If you listen to their story and confirm it with them and make them understand that you you know their point, you know what they're after, and you're you indeed are interested in a in a deal that makes sense uh, for them. When I start in a negotiating process, the first two questions I always ask is why are you here and what do you want to accomplish? You need to know what they need. You need to know, they need to know that you do want to be successful for them. And I couldn't agree more. It's, they don't care how much you know. They care. How, they they know, want to know how much you care. The uh, win-win. Um, I think is it, is it, uh, is part of win-win that you, each side has to lose a little. And I mean, in, they have to, in, I don't mean lose in the sense that the end deal isn't better but lose in the sense they came in expecting, expecting something and they give it up as part and they, they reach a new understanding, a new plateau that if they give that up, they'll, they'll get a lot more. That's exactly what I was going to say. You stole it. So uh, yes, when you start and you find out what they want, the key thing is, not everything on their list and not everything on my list is what we're going to accomplish. We have to agree early on the things that we can give up so we can get to the win-win. I have done multi-billion dollar deals where I was in one transaction, and I won't go into all the details, but they started out by saying they needed to get to a billion dollars. We did some pre-evaluation, and we were worried they would want to do 1.5. So the fact that we did more analysis, we found it was really worth 900 billion, 900 million. When they realized they had to give up a hundred million, but then we gave them a way to get back to their billion, they gave up to get to the win. If that's what works. Um, that sounds simple, but can you give us a, a sense of how they would get from the 900 million to the, on, to the billion? In, well, in that particular deal, we let them stay involved for a period of time to make up the difference. We knew that we could turn that company into a $2 billion company. 
So it was worth us to give them a little more space so we could get our hands on it. So that's a, that's a case where they couldn't get it up front, but they saw the credibility in what we were doing. They saw our vision. They thought that if they gave us it, they couldn't, they realized they could not get there with us. They could get it. We would buy them out at the rest at that point and then move on. Is, is that an earnout type of deal? That particular one was an earnout, exactly. Would you ex- That's right. Uh, Except for we took control, so we let them ride on our tail. A, a lot of our call, our listeners will be buying businesses, and so earnout is a a typical method of uh, win win for both sides. Can can you define it for us? An earnout works when you can have a clear and definable way to have an earnout. So what is an earnout? You first have to start with objectives or very clear objectives that you will reach in a very defined period of time. And if so, there will be an additional payment to the purchase price if it's a purchase in this case. Earnouts are usually when you're acquiring a business. So to give an example, a business, and we'll do a typical example, a business is doing $500,000 but they believe they would be doing 600,000 if they waited a year. We come up with clear, definable, objective things that will happen in the next 12 months. And if those things happen, we will adjust the price based on the new price at the end of the earnout period. By the way, there's two ways earnouts are done. One that you do a true up. So if the price, if the, if the revenues go down and the price goes down, or there is a cap and it's only a, a, a bonus at the end. Most are done with a bonus at the end. Let's talk about walkouts. The, uh, you said sometimes you got to walk away. Have, uh, first of all, have you ever walked away and then the other party at some point the next day, the next hour, a year later came back and wanted to read wanted to, to start negotiations again? Numerous times. But it doesn't even have to be a day or an hour. I was doing a transaction many years ago where I discovered there was a $4 million mistake. Of course, it wasn't in our favor. It was in the other side's favor. It was a mistake. It wasn't even a negotiating point. And they didn't want to adjust the price. And I simply said to them, I'm going to walk out of the room. And if you come out in 20 minutes and say you accept it, we can do the deal. And if you don't, I'm going to get my car and drive on. Um, in about 10 minutes, they came out and said, we thought it over your right. So, yes, it, walking, I have done several deals, but it's not that dramatic. I, I was working on a deal with loyalty. I don't want to say who it was. When we simply could not get to a transaction. As a matter of fact, we had a call. He said he would get back the following week. We didn't have a response. And what I did was write an email, an email that simply said, I'd like a courtesy of a response. If I don't have a response by such and such date, we're going to assume that you're not interested and we'll both part ways. We got a response the next day with a request to have another call. That's what I mean about walking away. Do you have any favorite deals? Because I'm going to go through a couple of my favorite deals in my past. Uh, Do you have any that you'd like to talk about that were uh, particular interest or uh, novel, unique ways to do a deal? Before I tell mine. Well, I think as far as novel and unique ways, I'm always trying to look for what's creative to make a deal happen. And I did a deal a few years ago. Again, I can't say who the companies are where what is really unique about this one is the person was very sick. And he was only doing the deal because he thought he was going to die. And we really didn't want to do a deal on that case because we needed him in there. And what we ended up doing is we asked him to train our new replacement. He got so excited about it. He helped us do three other deals. He got healthy. He stayed with us. Um, So, again, that's going back to understanding their needs, understanding what you're doing. 
as far as tricks and, and, and ways, and I don't like the word tricks, but as far as ways to make deals happen, um, I was working on a transaction uh, several years ago where the other side had a real issue with finances. They had a real issue with, they needed more money up front than we were willing to pay. And what we did to settle that deal without going into particulars, we went to their lenders and we let them know what the deal we were about to do. And not only were we able to get the lenders to delay the payments, they lowered the payments based on the deal we were doing. That's what I mean. You get to get outside the box and try to hear what the hurdles are and get them solved. So let me give you a, a, a deal or two of mine that I that I really uh, enjoyed, and and they happened so long ago. I'm I'm going to name the participants, and even though one of them is uh, one of the most fearful, guess what the most fearful government agency is the the people well, are based most. On my fearful. background, I'd, I'd have to say the IRS. Right, exactly. So. It's 1986, and uh, a lot of our listeners aren't weren't even born. And we had uh, we had pioneered electronic filing. We were one of the the uh, first um, providers of electronic filing in the country. So much so that the IRS saw us being computerized before Block and H and R Block, and so they they opened the country gradually in in stages. And in 1986. They only allowed uh, seven cities to offer electronic filing. And w- one of the cities they picked was here in Virginia Beach because we were such a big provider and we were already using the computer. And Block had gone away from computerization in, in the early 80s. They said, uh, people ask us why we don't computerize. And they say, and, and we say, why should we? We tried it. Doesn't save any money. We're never going to computerize. And so... In 1986, we joined electronic filing, and I'm proud to say that in Virginia Beach, there were 5,200 returns electronically filed that year, and we did over half of them. We did more than Block and all the other accountants combined. Uh, that's that's how successful we were in electronic filing. And, and so uh, there was only, that year, there was only 78,000 returns sent in the entire United States. Now there are 70 million returns sent, but... Um, we were early, and, and we came in in February. They invited the top five or seven largest providers. And we came in, and they said, and they asked us how we could, what our advice would be. Well, in in beginning electronic filing, you had to take a test. And they sent 50 tax returns, and you had to enter the 50 tax returns into your software. And they said in the instructions, you have to find the three mistakes. So after doing the 50 returns, we said, which of the 300 mistakes are the three that you want us to find? And uh, they sort of laughed that off and uh, went back the next year. And and again, there's hundreds of mistakes on their, their forms. What the IRS learned is they're better at checking returns than doing returns. And so we went to them and said... Uh, that and this was when I was at Jackson Hill. We said we will be happy. Uh, they're in Washington, so it's a it's a three hour drive from Virginia Beach. We said if you'll send someone down, we'll be glad to edit the returns before you send them out to the rest of the country. So so you don't look bad, and everyone's it's easier for everyone. And we're not going to charge you anything. We'll be happy to to um, edit the returns for, for you. So the next year they came down. And they had two, I think there were just two individuals, either two or three. And they uh, brought the returns and they were so, again, they were so bad. We In a week, we couldn't fix them. And so they were there for about four or five days and they went back. And, and what happened is thereafter, they gave us a sole provider deal where uh, we were we were providing for about four years we were uh, being paid by the IRS to develop the IRS test. So the test that everyone took in the country was was produced by, by Jackson Hewitt. And they finally had a great test that people didn't complain about. So I got this great multi-year deal where you're a sole source provider. So that's what the IRS is saying when they say that, or the government says when they say that. There's no one else that could do this in the whole country. But I got, I got that um, deal from just um, 
doing the right thing, trying to help at first, and then it, monetizing it later. Uh, one other, I'll give you one other one, and then uh, I'll keep going if you don't have deals to talk about. But another one was with Walmart. In 1993, um, Walmart was just trying tax preparation. They were testing with H&R Block. And so I asked for a meeting. Uh, Jackson, there were only two large national players in 1993. And uh, um, I asked for a meeting at Walmart, and I visited Walmart in, in February 1993. And they were testing in somewhere around, as I said, 50, 50 locations with Block. And, and I said, we'd like to test because, and, and I tried to explain to them that if you go into Bentonville, Arkansas, and go into the Walmart, everyone that goes into that Walmart knows that where the H&R Block is. So you're just cannibalizing the Block. But if you bring in Jackson Hewitt, then people that wouldn't go to Block would come to Walmart. And they said, well, that's interesting, but we don't even know if we like tax. So I was, I was a bit sick by that statement because I was afraid Block was going to screw it up and Walmart would never get in the industry. And, uh, but they said something that, was, that, was, that made my heart sail. And they said, uh, the, but the good news is if we, once we get into industry, we always like to have two providers. And so I was ecstatic because there's only two providers possible in the whole country. And I knew that if, if they went on in that program, they would, they would um, uh, pick us as the second provider. So what happened then, next step, so we, we were so um, genuine and um, uh, trustworthy and believable that when Sam's Club wanted to test uh, doing tax preparation and block didn't want to go into Sam's club. So we, so I didn't really, I mean, Sam's club is, is a lot less foot traffic than a Walmart and a lot less of our customer base. There are more businesses and an H and R block or, or a, a, a tax or our, at our level, we're after the consumer, not small businesses. We do 95% of our businesses is consumer, but it was my getting my foot in the door with Walmart. So we went into Sam's Club in in 1994 in about uh, have, or about 14 locations around the country, and then block, block um, in 1990 going into 1995 tax season it was kind of disastrous for the whole industry. It was the worst ever in my 52 year career for the industry, and so Block saw that and. On, in December, they were going to go into 100 Walmarts, and they called them up and said, no, we can go, only go into 50. So because we had gone with Sam's Club, and they uh, respected us, and we did a good job and, and uh, got along well with management and, and corporate, the, uh, they asked us, could you take any of these 50 locations? And we were able to take almost half the locations with only one month's notice. So... What happened within two years, not only did, did we get into Walmart, but they threw Block out. And so to this day, to, uh, uh, in 2021, Jackson Hewitt was in 3,000 Walmarts and H&R Block was in none. So we got that deal by not quickly trying to score in the first year or the first month or the first two years, thinking long-term, doing the right thing, and and as you, we talked about before, gaining credibility with the, the biggest company now in the world. Thoughts? Those are, great, those are great examples. And whether it's a big deal or those, it's all those same principles. You know, if I could just spend a minute and talk about something that's closer to the ledger's company. And, you know, the, the way franchisees grow is there's only three ways. It's what's called inbound marketing, outbound marketing, and acquisition. So acquisition is negotiation. And buying a book of business, I can remember helping a franchisee a few years ago who got a book of business in his market. It was $600,000. And he hadn't did any analysis, and he, he said he was going to offer 700000 for it. I said, why are you going to offer 700000 for a book of business at six hundred? He said, oh, i just got to have it. I want it. And that goes back to he wanted it more than the other party did. I said, to him, have you done analysis? He said, no, let's do analysis. After we did analysis, we thought it was only worth about 500000 Oh, no, I don't want to go down to 500000 
I finally got on the phone with the other party. The other party wanted 800000 But Then we showed him he had declining revenues, and I went through all the things, and I let him know that if he can get another offer, we'll, we'll match it by 10% at his price. So he didn't get an offer in two weeks. He called us back. He said, is the 500000 still available? We did further analysis. We did it only because the franchisee wanted to. But what he started out with six to 700000 he got 500000 for it. And that's because we knew who it was. But more importantly, we didn't want more than the other side did. When you change that dynamic, you get a much better deal. Yeah, but you said that earlier and several times now. You got to be able to. You got to be able to walk away. That's right. The uh, I'll tell you one more. My this is my this could be my favorite deal. Um, the in that. In taxis in 1995, that I described as it take take me a long time to explain what how the IRS caused a problem, but um, suffice it to say, they they um, lend uh, the industry would lend money to taxpayers to get their refund the same day or, or within. Back then, it was uh, I guess it took it two or three days, but today it's instantaneously. But um, the IRS uh, made a mistake and they did some editing on, on questionable returns and they held up 30% of the refunds of, of our taxpayers and they held them up. They, they had intended my belief. They never announced this. My belief was they intended to hold about 3%, somewhere between three tenths of a percent and 3%. And they misprogrammed it. So they held up 30% of the refunds. Well, the uh, the banks and were paid back because you would form you would um, develop a a bank account for a customer. You, when the customer refund came, it would go into the bank account, and the bank would get take a repayment for their loan. Well, what the IRS did when they kicked out these thirty thirty percent of the returns, they they were unable to. Um, send it to the bank 10 weeks later, they held them for 10 weeks and they, and they did manual transactions. And so 10 weeks later, the customer would get his refund and they were unable to send it to the bank who had made the loan. So the, uh, the banks weren't paid and we had our funds taken out, our tax preparation fees taken out from the bank and we weren't paid. Our franchisees weren't paid because you can imagine how many of the, our customers, who were used to getting a refund in two or three days, uh, it, when it came 10 weeks later, came rushing in to pay us and thank us. I mean, essentially zero, right? No one, we didn't get paid by any of them. So, so in the industry, we lost millions of customers who weren't paid. Well, there was a bank then that's since merged and, and, uh, it was, uh, let me see, that was 95. So statute of limitations run out. They don't exist anymore. So they probably can't sue me, but, uh, Chase Bank and Chase Bank at the time was one of the top three banks in the country. And they had made the mistake of getting into the industry exact, almost exactly the wrong time. The pre, they had got in in 1994 and did it by themselves and lost money because they weren't good at it. And so they came to us and negotiated a deal where we would, we would uh, give them customers and we would use our software to do the bank loan application and so forth. And we would take the lion's share of the profit, uh, but we had to guarantee the profit so or guarantee the loans that they didn't lose money. So uh, because of what happened in 95, we owed them a uh, million, million dollars or a million and a half dollars um, uh, after the tax season. And we didn't have it. We, we um, were, were devastated because we weren't paid and uh, our franchisees weren't paid. We weren't getting royalties. And so long story short, they sued us. We settled. And the settlement was we would pay them in payments from, from December until April and they, uh, we would get to keep all the receivables, which were only 60% due to us. We were able to keep it. And because they didn't understand the value of their receivables, they, we threw into the deal all the receivables they had from the other vendors. And so it was just an incredible win for us because we were able to, to uh, get all of that because they just didn't understand. They were happy. They got their money. They got their million, million and a half dollars, but they didn't understand the opportunity they were leaving behind. Well, we've run out of time, Steve. Any last, uh, any last thoughts? Well, 
you know, we're, we're the best negotiators if we're parents. But for those of us who are parents, we learn negotiating skills with our kids. <laughs> And I let people, I have people always think back how many times we negotiate with our kids to make something happen that's good in their lives. So we start there, but as long as it's win-win and we're willing to walk and we do what's best, have credibility and confidence, anyone can do it. Thank you, Steve. I, I don't think my, par- my, my children would say I was a, a good negotiator with them. I, I tended to always win. Uh, Th- thank you. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how to build your empire with John Hewitt. Find John on LinkedIn at John T. Hewitt or message John Hewitt on Facebook. This is I Compete, live from the castle, building your empire with John Hewitt. Don't miss new episodes every Monday by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, cpnshows.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this was I Compete, Building Your Empire with John Hewitt.